Well, I have the unenviable task of speaking to you right after lunch. So I'm going to try to keep things lively. Um, it is a bit of a long presentation, um, but I'm hoping to build off of some of the things that Catherine presented. You will hear a few things again, um, which hopefully will reiterate some of the key points here. Um, but mostly I'm going to actually focus on um, toxic chemicals, not so much as you might find them in the food system, but how you might find them in other aspects of our everyday lives for this presentation. There'll be some general environmental health information as well um, throughout. Um, next slide. It is a prezi, so apologies for anyone who gets a little motion sickness. I try not to make it spin too much. Um, so our learning objectives today, um, first is uh, we want folks to be able to list three different routes of human exposure uh, to toxic chemicals in our homes and the environment, um, to list three different health problems that are linked to this exposure uh, to toxic chemicals in products, homes, and the environment. Um, what we're going to cover today, first I'm going to go through our toxic problem and why we have such a toxic problem in our society. Um, again, uh, highlight those routes of exposure, so one of your learning objectives there. Talk a bit about vulnerable populations, in particular children um, and pregnant mothers. Um, some considerations when you're thinking about toxic chemicals and their impacts on the body, and that all things are not always equal. Um, some information and studies on pollution in people or body burden. Um, we're going to go through this acronym CHOPS, um, which can be useful for environmental health assessments um, when you're talking to um, patients in the clinic um, to find out about exposures. And then dig a little bit deeper into why, again, are we so toxic in our environment and what can we all do? Um, okay. So what we have is a growing body of science that's showing that many of the products that we use in our everyday lives have been linked to a whole host of different health effects. Um, such as increasing levels of learning disabilities, infertility, certain links to certain cancers, um, IQ loss, um, things like that. And um, these contaminants, unfortunately, come from everywhere. You've heard from Catherine in particular about the food system today. Um, and so, I, again, I won't be focusing there, but I'm going to focus on some of the other products in other places in the environment where we might be exposed to chemicals. So maybe it's the uh, products that we give to our kids um, for toy or care, cleaning products, even in the case of the Flint water crisis and in many communities across Michigan and the United States, our drinking water has a lot of contaminants in it. Um, maybe our own homes and the furniture we use can be contaminated or the personal care products that we use every day. Next slide. So again, I'm going to focus on industrial chemicals that are found in the products um, around us. Catherine's focused on food, and I think we'll hear some, uh, some air toxics from Mara and Alexis later. <clears throat> so there are a number of different ways that we can be exposed to chemicals. I've shown three of them here. Um, there's a fourth. Um, so inhalation, uh, again, if you're thinking about air toxics or volatile organic compounds, um, things even like radon in the environment that you can, you can inhale. Um, ingestion, again, obviously through food, you might think of children ingesting um, lead contaminated dust or paint chips. Um, obviously, water that's contaminated could be ingestion, excuse me, ingestion, and skin absorption. So, many of the personal care products we use are in our, our Skin is a huge organ in our body, and we can actually absorb a lot of different chemicals through those. But it's not just the things we intentionally put on our skin. There have been studies, for example, that have shown that chemicals called bisphenol A or bisphenol S, EPA, BCS, can actually come off products like thermal paper receipts and be absorbed through your skin that way. Um, and then the final one that's not shown there, the kind of is um, in, in relevant to some of your work is, of course, intervenous. Um, we know that certain chemicals like phthalates can actually come out of IV bags and things like that, and be, um, people can be exposed that way. So, even though there wasn't a picture there. <clears throat> so, not all toxicants are created equal, and their effects are really influenced by a number of biological and environmental factors that surround them. Um, certain conditions can cause a toxicant to have a greater impact on one person's life than another. Um, so, there are many different considerations here. This is really hard to see, I apologize. Um, this is uh, mercury. You can see the HG there, you can't see it. Um, and these are fish. <laughs> um, 
and essentially what we're showing here is that mercury that would come out of, um, for example, the burning of coal in coal-fired power plants can settle into um, a, a lake, like the Great Lakes, um, and then it settles into the, into the sediment, it, it builds up in the food system until it reaches um, humans, who are the top of the food system. Um, and so as you move up, you have more and more accumulation of those toxins. So that bioaccumulation is important to think there. The Great Lakes have a lot of different persistent bioaccumulative and toxic chemicals in them. Unfortunately, we have fish advisories in our state for chemicals like mercury, like PCBs, and even some emerging contaminants that I'll touch briefly on later in the presentation, including um, perfluorinated or PFOS chemicals, um, and even some flame retardant chemicals um, like PVDD. The timing of exposure here is really important, and Catherine mentioned this in her presentation. So certain exposures at a critical developmental window in a child or in a fetus or at a critical moment during pregnancy can have an impact on the developing body in a way that it might not for us as adults. Um, however, the same can be said of, of the elderly, that there are impacts that can happen later in life. Um, I'm going to spend most of the conversation focusing on, on um, young children um, and those particular vulnerable windows, but there are good resources um, on older folks and the elderly and impacts there <clears throat> that we can point you to. Um, so um, the next piece over here is synergy. We're not exposed to any just one thing anywhere. Um, so if you think about, if you think about a common home, maybe there's lead paint on the wall. Maybe you're using, um, you know, cleaning products that has some, some different volatile organic compounds in it. Maybe you have, you're living next to a highway and you've got diesel emissions and things like that. So there are different ways that these, that chemicals can act synergistically together, which is important to consider. But synergy, synergy just doesn't happen with chemicals themselves. Certain things like stress can actually impact the way a chemical will act on the body. For example, um, in rodent studies with mice, um, mice that were um, in a stressful situation and exposed to the chemical bisphenol A or BPA had more growth of breast cancer cells than mice who still had the exposure to the chemical but without that. Um, so, some of these things lead to this piece here on sort of your social economic and your, your other personal influences or the, the um, stressors in your lives there. So, different folks living in different communities and different situations will have impact as chemicals. Um, and then, finally, I want to talk about low doses. And you can move to the next slide. Maybe. In theory. All right. Um, so in public health, um, oftentimes we used to think the dose makes the poison, right? So this is sort of your dose response curve, a typical one. Like here at a low dose, you really don't have much happening when you're exposed to something. But then at the high dose, eventually it leads to death, um, perhaps at the highest level there. But certain chemicals that are endocrine disruptors or hormone disruptors have what's called a non, you can't really read this, non-monotonic curve. And here's a couple of different examples. Because endocrine disruptors act in the body at such very low levels often, just like our hormones do, you might actually see something here where at a very low level of a hormone disrupting chemical, you have an effect. At a sort of medium level, that effect falls off, and then it may go up again. So there's different chemicals have different sort of dose response curves there. And so unfortunately, you know, we're learning a lot more about how particularly those endocrine disrupting chemicals, which will be a focus today, are affecting our bodies in ways that we hadn't really thought of when we were thinking about maybe something, maybe like a heavy metal like lead, where we're, we're likely to see, um, obviously, those increasing effects as we have more and more exposure and higher rates building up in the body. Next slide. Oh, oh was that the wrong one? Yeah. Interesting. Wait a minute. Oh, those are jumping all around. <laughs> nope. Okay. How do we get back to? Everybody back here. No. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 This is going to be challenging. <laughs> um, can I? Oh, did you try to go in 
the back for a bit. That's what I was saying. Because it has quite a bit. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have in here. It doesn't have like the tab. Oh, tab? Yeah. No, it's not in it. <laughs> Sorry. All right, we might just have to. It might be easier just to start over. Start over, yeah. Okay, here we go. I want to quit it. Okay, anyway, Sorry, guys. so I'm going to talk about vulnerable populations while we wait for the slides to come up. It's not that exciting to slide. Mm -hmm. um, so, before a baby is even born, um, the developing fetus um, is, a, is a, a particularly vulnerable population. And critical developmental moments are happening in all organs and tissues, including rapid, rapid growth in the brain, the reproductive and endocrine systems, perfect, um, and so on. So in a study um, that the University of California, San Francisco put out looking at CDC data, they found that over 99% of women in the study, 250 pregnant women, were found to carry multiple chemicals in their bodies that could then be passed on to their fetus including um, PCBs, pesticides, um, phenols, flame retardants, and phthalates. The number of those are, are those endocrine-disrupting um, chemicals. So phthalates, um, an endocrine-disrupting chemical, are anti-androgenic, and they can interfere with male genital growth development in the fetus. Um, and then another flip um, side of that is that female fetal exposure to BPA um, may be linked to worse behavioral and emotional control later in life. Flame retardants, um, phthalates are one of the chemicals you're going to see throughout this presentation. Another um, class of chemicals are flame retardants, particularly halogenated flame retardants. Those are flame retardants um, with usually a chlorine um, or a bromine um, in their structure. So um, certain flame retardants have been linked to low birth weight babies and neurotoxicity, um, and I'll touch on that later on. Um, we used to feel that the placenta um, uh, could protect, this is pretty old thing, you know, protect the fetus, um, but unfortunately with a lot of different chemicals, that's certainly not the case. Um, and the, the fetal brain in particular lacks that blood-brain barrier um, and certain detoxification capabilities in their, in their bodies to process some of these chemicals like we would. Um, young children, of course, are also um, really vulnerable. Um, rapid growth, higher metabolism, children proportionally eat, drink, and breathe much more than we do. Um, and they also, in body burden studies, have been found to have higher rates of certain chemicals like uh, flame retardants or um, certain heavy metals in their bodies than we do as adults. Um, they're exposed to these toxicants because they live closer to the ground than we do. Um, they also have very natural hand-to-mouth behavior. This is how babies and toddlers explore their world. It's a healthy behavior, except when you put toxic chemicals into the mix. Um, so the fact that children, young children's organs and tissues are developing quickly makes them particularly susceptible to different insults from chemicals. Um, and as well as when we thought about the fetus not able to process certain chemicals like we can as adults, that's the same with young children. Okay. Um, I wasn't ready for that, but that's fine. Um, so a couple of other places. Um, I'm going to talk later in the presentation about some occupational exposures um, and things, uh, particularly focusing on breast cancer and occupational exposures. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about hotspot communities, so communities that are facing a disproportionate burden of pollution um, just by, by proxy of where they are in relation to polluting industries um, or other environmental stressors that may be in, in those areas. So biomonitoring or body burden testing has found toxic chemicals in pregnant women, uh, breast milk, Catherine mentioned umbilical cord blood, um, the bodies of health professionals like you all, um, children, and children and adults. And as I mentioned before, children tend to have higher levels of chemicals than adults do. Unfortunately, health professionals like you all also tend to have higher levels of certain chemicals in the body than folks who work in an office like myself. Next slide. So we're going to go into, we're going to visit a little home here in a moment on the slide presentation to look at where certain exposures occur. Um, next slide. The helpful memory here is chops. 
Um, so we're going to briefly go through some of these things. So community, home, hobbies, occupation, personal, and socioeconomic. And if you're seeing, uh, there's a, a number of different resources out there where if you are seeing a patient in a, in a clinic and you want to do an environmental health history, this is a helpful acronym to think through. There are just tools that you can use to do so. We'd be happy to connect you with those. Next slide. So the community. Oops. Did we do anything else? Oh, maybe it was a split. I might have, yeah, I might have. That's fine. Um, so community. Um, so again, as I mentioned, Certain um, certain communities, particularly communities of color um, and uh, lo so lower socioeconomic communities, are often co-located next to polluting industries. And so, if you're living next to a smokestack, if you're living in Detroit near the incinerator, um, near the marathon refinery, all kinds of different things. If you're next to landfills, even if you're next to a public park, if there's really if there's a lot of spraying of pesticides and things like that. Um, farming, um, not Catherine talked quite a bit of that, or co-location co to highways and things like that can expose you to certain um, chemicals that can be detrimental to health. Um, but I'm going to go a little bit closer to home. So there's a lot of different hidden hazards in our home. Um, and again, specifically, I'm going to focus on chemicals such as lead, phthalates, and flame retardants today. Lead is something that you're probably more familiar with, perhaps, than some of the other chemicals I'm going to talk about. So having the, a lot of health professionals are very aware of the impacts of lead and other heavy metals on the body. They've been studied very extensively and have been linked to neurological damage, cancers, kidney damage, poor bone health, and so on and so on. Um, lead in particular is something that we're focused on at the Ecology Center, and it's towards the end of the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about our work. Um, again, lead has led to, leads to a loss of IQ, um, an increased risk of ADHD, increased risk of juvenile delinquency and crime. Um, it's very costly to the individuals who have elevated blood lead levels, to their families, and to society. Um, we've done a number of cost reports here in Michigan where we've looked at what our rates of elevated blood lead levels are here in the state among children who are tested. Um, and what those associated costs are, and they're in, you know, the hundreds of millions of dollars, I think $270 million was our last study um, per year um, for families. And those costs break down to lost lifetime earnings, increased rates of juvenile crime and delinquency, and those associated costs, increased special education costs, and increased health care costs. Um, so let, um, before I get to this, we don't have to back. So lead exposure, we're going to talk a little bit about where it comes in all different places. Obviously, um, one of the places that um, is represented on this slide is uh, lead in water, and that's certainly something that we work on and is, is a concern. It's a huge, is a huge ongoing public health crisis in Flint and in other communities. Um, but lead paint is really important for us to consider in the state. It's likely that around 70% of lead poisoning comes from lead paint or lead paint associated dust in homes or soil um, that may be contaminated with, with legacy lead paint. Um, you also have lead exposure from um, soil that may be coming from a deposition of air along the heavily um, traversed routes when there was lead still in gasoline. Um, and then there are other point, force, um, point sources of lead exposure lead that can come out of demolition sites, unfortunately, and, and then land in contaminants as well. <clears throat> but moving from lead to other contaminants in drinking water, oh, sorry, back, does that work? <laughs> um, sometimes I pause two times during the slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Michigan's drinking water has, an, unfortunately, a lot of different contaminants in it. And it really depends on where you are. And so this is something that we are starting to look more into at the Ecology Center to see what we can do. So folks are probably quite familiar with the, the Flint water crisis um, and the population-wide um, likely exposure to lead there um, in folks' own homes. In rural areas of Michigan um, and in certain areas, you have natural occurrences of arsenic. Um, that can contaminate well water in particular. Um, and so again, something that may be of concern to certain um, clients that you might see. 
In areas like Oscoda and Rockford um, and surrounding areas, we have some contamination that's recently been getting a lot more press coverage on polyfluoridated or perfluorinated chemicals or PFOS chemicals. Um, in Rockford, you have the World Marine World Worldwide Plant um, that made shoes, uh, hush puppies, and all kinds of different shoe brands. And unfortunately, they were dumping their um, waterproofing chemicals. And that contaminated um, both the watershed and some of the drinking water and groundwater over there. So there's some cleanup efforts going on right now around Rockford Mission, which is in the west side of the state. In Australia, you have historical contamination from the Work Smith Air Force Base, um, where they used, uh, they did a lot of training on fighting fires on the Air Force Base. And to put out um, fires that are from um, airplane fluid, jet fuel, <laughs> you that a special name. Um, you actually need, like, you need particular compounds. And so these perfluorinated compounds are used in firefighting foam. Um, now you're seeing actually that foam is coming up on certain um, lake sides and water areas around Oscoda, and people are advised to not eat the fish, um, and they're advised to avoid the foam around that air force base. Um, and then even here in Ann Arbor, um, we have a 1,4-dioxane plume, um, which is for contamination. Um, this is a, a carcinogenic chemical um, that has contaminated some well, well waters and is, is actually moving towards the Huron River, um, which is a concern for all of Ann Arbor's water should the plume go that far. So unfortunately, we have to be concerned um, about our health when treating phyto for certain things, um, and kitties as well. Um, for in terms of different um, pesticides, essentially that you would be using for fleas and ticks and things like that. So there are some NRDC has some information on their website about safer alternatives there. If you have a pet or if you have folks asking about those things, you can look for safer alternatives there. We can get you those things too. Next slide. So personal care products, um, I'm going to spend a little bit more time here. So I mentioned phthalates already. And phthalates are a chemical that is found in so many different things. They are added to plastics, like vinyl plastic, to make them more flexible. They're called plasticizers in that way. The phthalates are also added to perfumes and shampoos and um, different things like that because they help fragrances adhere more or stick around longer in those products. So then we have phthalates in personal care products. Um, again, they're endocrine disruptors. Um, I mentioned some of the links um, on male um, genetic defects, um, reproductive defects. There's also um, some increased risk of um, um, increased risk of, of neurotoxicity and things along those lines. Um, lead is still found in many lipsticks on the market, um, which is surprising. Up to studies have shown up to seven parts per million in certain lipsticks and other makeup products too. Um, in Oakland County, I was chatting with some public health folks over there a couple of years ago, and they were worried about. Um, some of the immigrant community, some of the eye makeup and, and exposure to some high lead levels and certain um, types of makeup that folks are using there. Huh. And then sodium laurel or lauric sulfates are two common ingredients um, that often are contaminated with 1,4-dioxane, that's the same chemical that's polluting, uh, that's in the plume in Ann Arbor here, um, which is a known human carcinogen. Those chemicals are often found in shampoos and toothpaste and the active detergents or um, surfactants in those products. With some of these chemicals, you can now actually look at the label of a product on your shampoo and see that it's, you know, sodium laurel sulfate free, it's phthalate free. Um, so there's some good movement there because at least with personal care products, some of those ingredients have to be listed so you can see what's there. The trick with phthalates is they're often in the fragrance, which doesn't have to have um, the list of all the chemicals due to confidential business information. Um, but many companies are progressive and they're moving away from those and they're putting it right on the front of the bottle so you can find out whether or not it has those chemicals. Next slide. Next slide. 
So here under the sink, we have our cleaning products. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Um, the cleaning products can be very acutely toxic, obviously, um, through inhalation, through ingestion, um, or skin contact with the irritants to the eyes, the skin, pathogens, um, and cause other respiratory harm. So here, I mentioned flame retardant. Like phthalates, these are chemicals that are ubiquitous in our home environment. They're added to products to give them a, a flame retardancy, essentially, to infect. Well, they're supposed to make them less flammable. There's actually a lot of studies that show that they're they're almost completely ineffective um, and shouldn't be there. There's a terrific movie that we'll um, uh, send you all a link to. That I'm drawing blank on right now. Oh, the Thank you. <laughs> um, that has a lot of really great information about flame retardants. Um, so we'll put that in on the website so you can find that. So many different flame retardants, those halogenated flame retardants, again with a chlorine or a bromine um, molecule on them, are considered to be carcinogens, mutagens, reproductive and developmental toxicants, neurotoxicants, and endocrine disruptors. We keep playing a toxic game of whack-a-mole with flame retardants. So folks may remember PCBs as a flame retardant that were banned actually um, many years ago, decades ago. Then many different products like our furniture or our television then went on to have these chemicals called polybrominated diphenyl ethers or PBDEs. Don't worry, they're really um, These chemicals were banned in Michigan. Um, two of them were banned in 2004. Penta and Octa BBE, a third Deca BBE was then banned here. Um, but then many different states passed bans, and then eventually there was a federal voluntary action to move away from these three chemicals. Um, what we saw is that they moved just to over to chlorinated um, flame retardants, often chlorinated trips, um, which is a neurotoxic chemical. It was actually banned from use in children's pajamas in 1977 when it was found to be mutagenic um, and listed in California under their Prop 65 list as suspected carcinogen. Unfortunately, we went from PVDs to this. Some of these chemicals, particularly those PVDE chemicals, we are really learning about the neurotoxicity of those and the fact that they stick around in our environment and our food system um, and that even though they're not as often used in products that we have, they're still contaminating our bodies and they're still there. Um, a couple of years ago, maybe more than a couple now, um, Rick Rajitsky at Grand Valley State did a study where he tested fish from Great Lakes rivers and lakes, and every fish that he pulled out of those lakes and rivers had PBDE in them. Um, so and this was, I think, six or seven years after the ban when he first did the study. So, oh, this is super hard to see, unfortunately. Yeah, it's there. So this is this is a little bit getting towards the occupational side of things. So these flame retardants are dangerous for us on a long-term basis, right? Because they they actually come out of the product and they build up into the dust. Um, kids have higher levels of flame retardants again because they're exposed to that dust. Um, oh, we can see it. Um, but there are really there are really serious considerations for occupations like uh, like firefighters. Firefighters have really high cancer risk um, because when our homes burn or businesses, these toxic chemicals then transport and they're they have an even greater impact. So, or new chemicals are formed like dioxins and chlorine. So. Um, well, I'll read these. So this is these are different cancer rates. Um, increased risk for firefighters. This is mesothelioma, esophageal, mouth and larynx, spirit, yeah, kidney, oh my gosh, breast, intestinal, stomach, and lung. So you can see those increased cancer rates. This is 20, and then this is up to 140 um, for firefighters. So this gets to the next section on occupational risk. Firefighters are, are at a huge risk. Um, but others are as well. Next slide. I'm going to focus particularly on breast cancer and some of the studies that have been coming out on breast cancer and chemicals. 
So a growing number of studies are showing those links between occupational exposure and breast cancer. Um, and this is important for us to think about here in Michigan because one of the industries um, that has very high increases in breast cancer is the auto, uh, auto parts um, company. Um, other areas, before I get to autos, that have elevated risk include agriculture, cars and gambling, automotive plastic manufacturing, um, food canning, and metalworking. So this is pre-menopausal breast cancer risk that was, that was focused on in the study by Brophy and Keith. Um, in the automotive plastic industry workers, they're exposed to a number of mammary carcinogens, such as isocyanate to make the foam and seep. Um, the components of ABS plastic, which is acrylyl nitrile, mutadine, and styrene, they like styrofoam, um, styrene is a carcinogen. Um, and then endocrine disruptors, so back to those hormone disrupting chemicals, such as DPA and phthalates, and even brominated flame retardants. The other one listed here is canning. Um, and while we don't necessarily have a huge canning industry like we do um, an auto industry here, um, canning exposure often has those links to uh, BPA, those phenols, BPA and BPS. Um, the ecology study, ecology center has done studies on cans and looked at the material that's lining those cans and found, I don't remember the percentages, but a, a strong majority of cans to have those chemicals. We have launched those successful market campaigns that I'll speak about at the end to get manufacturers to move to safer alternatives. Um, so there are things we can do. I'm going to bring you way down here on this stuff and then try to give you some solutions at the end. Next um, slide. So closer to home for you all um, is the hospital. Next slide. So um, physicians for social responsibility uh, did a report. Um, in 2009, this is a bit old now, uh, 20 different nurses and physicians. We had two um, that we were able to work with and, and bring to the study from here in Michigan. They tested um, positive for over 24 different harmful chemicals, things like those polybrominated dicenal ethers, those flame retardants I spoke about, phthalates that I've been talking about, heavy metals like mercury, the phenol A that I spoke about, um, those perfluorinated chemicals or PFAS chemicals like in the water and food in Rockford, and then triclosan, which is um, an antimicrobial that's often in sort of the hand washes or things like that that you must have in the healthcare system. All of these chemicals um, were found in healthcare workers to be higher than the general population, unfortunately. Um, and it, it sort of risks and links they have their developmental and neurological effects reproductive dysfunction, cancer, and then different metabolic diseases. So um, remembering back to where that CHOPS thing, right, the CHOPS acronym, um, while this is not focus of this fellowship, because it often is a focus in a lot of your training, obviously diet, alcohol, consumption, tobacco use, over-the-counter prescription medications, um, illegal drug use or abuse, um, can lead to further environmental exposures and harmful contaminations. This isn't where we're going to focus, though, um, for this fellowship program. So then finally, the socioeconomic is really important to consider. Earlier on, I was talking about um, vulnerable communities and talking about um, the link between things like stress and poverty and contamination and how that can have um, an increasing impact in our bodies and also in, increased um, levels of, of contamination in areas that might be co-located next to highways or polluting industries or landfills or incinerators and so on. Um, so this is something that's really important to think about when we're thinking about um, those, those clients that we see, the communities where we live and where we work, um, and when we're in the public policy sphere, making sure that we're considering the most vulnerable populations in our state on um, the policy side of things. Um, next slide. Let's see if this works. Probably not. This should be a video. Oh. Is there a little play button? Yeah. It used to be like in the middle. <laughs> Since World War II, there has been a large increase in the manufacturing of chemicals. This was easily apparent in the 1950s, where these new substances were heralded as symbols of disease. This increase in production was coupled with limited testing, which is unfortunate because it means that the short and long-term health effects of the new chemicals 
Testing and safety regulations on toxic chemicals have largely not been updated for 40 years since the Toxic Substances Control Act. The first, as mentioned earlier, is that the EPA has proven these chemicals okay. to be unsafe before it can be regulated, right. rather than the industry being forced to prove the chemical safety for places. Because mm -hmm. toxics can appear in so many aspects of American life, from children's stories to the the personal care yeah. products, yeah. oversight is shared, but... Yeah. Okay. 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 She was a little...
So that's moving away from chemicals like flame retardants and phthalates and perfluorinated chemicals in furniture, carpets, and so on and so forth, and then mercury um, as well. So those are the four areas on the, the safer chemicals challenge, which we'll learn more about later in the um, fellowship. Next slide. So the other thing that we can do is we can move the marketplace. Earlier, I did mention that study on BPA and BPX in can lining. Um, so the Ecology Center, through Lauren's work and other colleagues' work at Healthy Stuff, we test consumer products for toxic chemicals, and then we work with retailers and manufacturers to move out of them. Um, another good example here is Home Depot. A couple of years ago, we started testing vinyl floor tiles, and we were looking for those phthalate chemicals in them. Um, unfortunately, phthalates not only don't stay in the chemicals, they or in the product, they migrate out, and you can have exposure even from your floor, particularly again for kids who are walking, crawling on the floor, um, and things along those lines. <clears throat> so those phthalates can come out of the product and then affect us. We did this study on phthalates in vinyl flooring, and we were able to get Home Depot, Lowe's, Lumber Liquidators, Menards, Floor and Decor, and there's probably a few others that I'm forgetting, to all agree to remove, to phase out phthalates by 2016 um, in their vinyl flooring. So that was a huge marketplace shift in that removed something like, what was it, 100 million pounds of, of phthalates from the market in the US. Um, so an incredible amount of chemicals off the market. Next slide. So car seats is another place that we have been focusing on for over a decade now at the Ecology Center. Car seats are a necessary item. When you have a child, you have to have this as a necessary safety item. But we feel like it shouldn't have toxic chemicals in them. So over the years, we've tested different car seat brands. And we found, focusing again on heavy metals and flame retardants, and we found that certain companies are doing a better and better job of getting those nasty chemicals out of them. But there's a long way to go. In 2017, Up a Baby was the first company to have a fully flame retardant free car seat which was great, and we celebrated this, but it was $350, and it was really expensive. Um, and we want to work with Upa Baby, and we encourage that, but not everybody can afford a car seat that, that expensive. So as such, we launched the car seat detox campaign, and we have over, well, at this point, when we made this slide, over 42,000 um, families from across the country and, in fact, across the world had signed on to our petition to call on Graco, um, children's products to move and produce a more affordable car seat option um, for the marketplace without flavor products. Great home has been driving the seat. And so we, we want to keep pushing and encouraging them. We had an activist join um, the coalition from the Learning Disabilities Association in Georgia and Atlanta and delivered the petition signatures over the summer or in fall, excuse me, um, to Great House. Um, we haven't moved them yet, but we're going to keep pushing. There are other, we have a car seat study coming out in late summer, early fall, and so that'll be something that you all can see the next results. We know there are a couple of other car seats that have gone flame retardant free in the meantime. Unfortunately, no affordable options just yet, um, but we're hopeful that we can keep pushing um, the envelope there. <clears throat> next slide. So, back to Sally. Unfortunately, um, as you heard from Catherine, certain chemicals can end up contaminating our food system. And so here's an intersection of our food program work with our toxic work. Um, Lauren and others um, in our Healthy Stuff project worked with outside laboratories to test the values in dairy products. And this is an example of a top trending New York Times article about values in macaroni and cheese. And we found that the more processed a uh, a dairy product is, the more the higher level of phthalates are found in it. So for hard cheeses or regular cheese, they have phthalates, right? But they but the things like the processed macaroni and cheese have had even higher levels. Other products that we tested um, at the same time included yogurt, infant formula, yogurt infant formula, mac and cheese powder and cheese. Yes, yes. So this is an ongoing piece of research and campaign for us as well. Next slide. So the main focus um, of this work is a target of a campaign on cleanup craft. So Kraft Heinz is the largest producer of cheese in the United States. 
Um, we've called on them again. This is a picture of the petition that we have out there. We've called on them to take action to explore their supply chain and find out where the phthalate contamination is coming from, to find out the processing side of things, what they can what they can do to clean up some of the contamination, and so on. Um, the next phases over the next year, we'll be looking at um, things like Lunchables, which is another Oscar Mayer to craft high brand. Um, we Later after that, we'll probably look at other products like um, liquid milk, um, ice cream, and cream cheese. Um, so some of those other products. Sally's often are in sort of the fattier foods as well. So we've started to focus on dairy. Um, and that which really came out of peer-reviewed literature that was showing that's the place to start with too. Next. <clears throat> Changing the law. Um, this is really where I get very excited. Um, most of my work is, has been on public policy initiatives at the local, state, and national level of my career at the Ecology Center. So as I mentioned, after 40 long years, TASCA was finally reformed at Toxic Substances Control Act in 2016. EPA last year, no, two years ago now, listed the first 10 priority chemicals. Um, some of those may be familiar to us. 1,4-dioxane, again, that, that plume here in Ann Arbor was one of those chemicals. We knew when this law passed that there could be challenges with an EPA and an administration that was not environmentally friendly. And we have one of the worst EPAs and administrations to oversee the implementation of TOSCA um, that I could possibly imagine. Um, so, since taking office, President Trump has appointed a number of different chemical industry allies to oversee the TOSCA program. The first one was Dr. Nancy Beck, who came directly from the American Chemistry Council, where she had been lobbying only months before against the new TOSCA bill and law that she now oversees the implementation on. That's bad news. Mm -hmm. um, one of the slightly bright spots is Last year, the Ecology Center and our allies nationwide effectively blocked the nomination of Dr. Michael Dorson to lead the EPA office's Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxins. Dorson was horrifying to be in an oversight role here. Um, he had a long history of working for the tobacco and chemical industries to promote hazardous substances and to downplay the risks of secondhand smoke of uh, toxic chemicals like one for dioxane, followed with the perfluorinated chemicals, petroleum coke, um, and many more. Um, fortunately, because of all of the strong opposition that came from across the country, um, Dr. Dorsey's conflict of interest was there was light shed on that, and he went through his nomination for consideration. So they didn't actually even get to a vote um, because it would have been it would have been lost. Um, so, we still have to work um, much more in a, it's less fighting for something positive right now at the federal level and, and, and more fighting World well Act um, on, on TOSCA and their chemical policies nationally. We can make some positive changes locally, um, and these are smaller steps, but they're really important. So, over the last three Three or four years, fellows have been working with me on local procurement policies and putting together different pieces of policies that could be um, taken on by a city or a county or other municipality um, to actually have them purchase products that don't contain toxic chemicals. Um, I'm really excited because we've been working really recently with the city of Ann Arbor right here, and we may have one of the most progressive environmentally sustainable purchasing policies in relation to toxic chemicals or not purchasing toxic chemicals and products. Um, and so I'm hoping that will become public soon and we'll definitely share that with you. I think there are other um, cities and places in the state where we can make some progress too. There's been some initial interest in places um, like Farmington Hills and Dearborn. Um, and so we're excited about some of that work at the local level. Next slide. And then at the state level, <clears throat> so ending childhood lead poisoning has always been a piece of our work at the Ecology Center, but has obviously been elevated in the last few years in the wake of the water crisis. And again, we're focusing on lead in all different environmental media here. Um, 
I currently serve on the um, state led commission, so child led child led elimination commission, and we have recently put out an action plan to that has a combination of different activities that can be done regular through the regulatory mechanism or legislative mechanism, funding mechanisms, educational pieces, and so on to address childhood led exposure. Um, a couple of things I want to highlight here that will come up through the fellowship program, particularly when we go to Lansing, this will be one of the issues that we'll be talking to lawmakers about. You have an opportunity to get your feet wet with some, um, some advocacy on lead earlier if you like. There's a lead education day that's being planned for April 18th, which we'll send information to you on by the Mission Alliance for Lead Safe Homes, which is really on the steering committee for, and we'll be talking with lawmakers about these different issues there. Um, I break these up into primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention um, here for lead poisoning. Um, primary prevention is essentially we need to stop using kids as lead detectors in our society and finding out that there's lead in a home because we find a child with an elevated blood lead level. This is a heavy list list here politically, um, but what we're working towards and what one of our top goals in the lead commission is, is to make sure that we're testing homes themselves. So the, the water, the paint, the soil for lead contamination at the sale or transfer of a home so that a lead inspection risk assessment is done and then there's follow-up abatement and mitigation of those risks. So doing that before we find a kid that's been lead poisoned in a home can make an incredible difference there. Um, and we think that at the time of sale and transfer is the time to do so. Secondary prevention, um, universal testing for all one and two year olds in the state. Um, there are a number of different um, pieces that would fall underneath that. Um, so right now only Medicaid children is, um, or children who are screened and referred by their pediatrician are often tested for elevated blood lead levels. Um, and many kids fall through the cracks um, only about 20% of Michigan kids are actually tested for lead each year. So universal testing um, would be simple and clear. There are some obstacles there. We need to make sure that it that it's covered not only by Medicaid, but by private insurance. So there are a number of different pieces to make this happen that when we go into our Lansing Day, we'll go through some of those details. Um, identifying and remediating lead hazards. There are programs already in the state making sure that we're fully funding those programs to um, when a child does present with an elevated blood lead level that we can get into the home, that there are resources to um, address those hazards there. Um, and then tertiary prevention, so helping kids who've been lead poisoned. So if you have elevated blood lead levels, there are things that we can do for a child to um, to help give them the best outcome possible, making sure that they have adequate um, nutrition and access to healthy foods, making sure that they're getting high quality early education to overcome any barriers when your IQ loss and things like that, um, and various other pieces um, of, uh, of mitigating those effects of lead that we can take on. Um, okay, I think that's the last slide. Oh. Yes. <laughs> so I I didn't really give you guys any time for questions. So what questions do you have, or is there something that I can clarify, or something that you learned that was surprising? Mm -hmm. I'm a little curious if there's um, the current legislation that requires like the presence of polymer charges in child abuse because I could see that yeah. perspective like during a crash you want some kind of protection and so right. Yeah, there is. So okay. there's a NHTSA standards, National Institute of Highway Traffic, Traffic. Traffic. Yeah. Safety Association. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is it's the same standard for the car itself. Okay. Um, one of the arguments is that if your your car is on fire, it's not usually the yeah. car seat yep. isn't going to be the issue here. Mm -hmm. um, exactly your problems at that point. Exactly. I mean, this is a this is a, a vehicle with a high you know an accelerant mm -hmm. in the fuel itself uh -huh. and everything else. And so there's a lot of there are some policies. Um, or sorry, there's some pushes right now to look at that standard. Yeah. We actually think it's not a good time. At the federal level, to be revisiting the standard. <laughs> um, that we probably made it for a while. <laughs> like, exactly, and that's yeah. a huge risk. Yeah. And so we've talked to some of our partners, like at the friendly different car seat companies, who are like, yeah, let's go and let's, let's look at this and revise this, and like, it could get worse. Mm -hmm. And so <coughs> there are stronger flame retardancy standards for other areas like air and, and things like that, so they could increase those levels. Right. 
my yeah. So right now the timing isn't right for the right. federal level to change them. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. So the question I have was regarding the car seat as well. So yeah. say for example it's hot outside, the car window yeah. closed up. Is there some type of chemical change or something that is yeah leaking out of the yeah. materials into the car that's putting them at more risk too? Yeah, definitely. So you so Sunlight in particular has been shown to have to affect the these flame returns are usually in the fabric of the foam yeah. of a car seat and they can cause those chemicals to migrate out. We've actually um, we didn't publish it, but we've done some studies with um, different academic labs where you look at the levels of foam in a car, in your car seat car, and you can find that that there are valleys are migrating out, so there are less in certain layers and more in other layers. And we also done dust wipes in cars and in homes and in other places or vacuum testing where you find those chemicals in the dust. And so what we tell folks to do in your car is try to park it in shade, park it in, um, in your garage if you have one. Um, clean your car, so use vacuum with a HEPA filter, you know, take a wipe, um, a wet wipe that's and wipe down the dust, keeping that dust down is going to keep down exposures. But in effect, I don't do that. I know all this stuff. I can't keep up with that stuff. And so it's it's not, to, to me, it's we have to change these things. If, if you remember Catherine's pyramid from the CDC, we have to change the public policy. We have to change the marketplace because it's not my job to, to figure out all of these things. And it's not your patient's job to have to wait through all this with every other thing in your life and you're worried about your kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there are things to put Yeah, but like you said, that. how realistic is it? I mean, the flu right. is one thing because you see it, your experience, but, yeah. but this is different. And I've never, um, we call it anticipatory guys, I've never given this piece of it. Right. So I know there is some research about how um, you start regulating certain chemicals that there's a lot of contamination, kind of living companies, and then they use other chemicals that are yeah. as harmful or potentially worse. So yeah. I just wonder, like, how do you overcome some of those barriers that yeah. you just have to be these overarching laws, or what do you do to prevent those things? Yeah. So that was the concept. So I mentioned the toxic whack-a-mole with flame retardants and how different states could ban CDEs and then chlorinated trips came up and then that gets phased out and something else comes up. And so with the idea when we were really working for cluster reform was that umbrella law to really look at classes of chemicals and not switch from one bad thing to another. Um, the can mining is a good example where GM food had BPA, and everybody learned about BPA and baby bottles and sippy cups, and everybody wanted BPA out. And they're like, we're BPA free, and they moved to BPS. And so it's just moving from one thing to another. So we're mindful of that. At certain levels, like at a state policy level, it, it can be really challenging to get that comprehensive um, class level um, policy packed. It's starting to happen. Um, I would say in more productive cases than Michigan at the moment. Um, but it's something that we have our mind on and we're looking for. When we look at even the local policies that I talked about, the environmentally preferable purchasing, we're talking about classes. And so we're trying to get to that at that state level, even with the purchasing power of the city to not buy products with toxic flame products, um, to not buy products that have perforated chemicals. And so on. So getting at the class instead of the individual kind of choice. Other questions? Yeah. Sure. Oh. No. Okay. Sorry. Right. Yeah, I have one more. It sounded like they were going to do some kind of um, investigation into supply chains mm -hmm. for the macaroni and cheese and maybe like dairy stuff too. Is, yeah. Are there current theories on where so many phthalates are getting in? Yeah. Do you want to talk about that? You want me to? Uh, yeah, I can talk about that. Um, so we did do some uh, confidential, I think we'll be making it public in the coming months, but it's not right now on dairy equipment. Um, so we did some screening in our lab looking for phthalates and we did find um, 
phthalates in one particular piece of smoking equipment, that was the teacup liner. So those are the mm -hmm. inflations that go around the udders. Mm -hmm. um, and it was at a pretty high level, high to 11% um, DEHP, um, so that's concerning. And then um, through our research, we found that one hosing company has up to 30 to 40% DEHP mm -hmm. in their hosing. Uh, so that might be a possible source. Um, we do have some confidential um, talks going on with different milk uh, supply companies, and through there we we found maybe another potential source. Mm -hmm. So um, we're not entirely sure right now, but we are investigating it. Mm -hmm. I think it's coming from a lot of different places. Right. That that it's it's in you know it may be in the milk because it may be in the mm -hmm. oil and the food that the cows are eating. Mm -hmm. But then as there's more processing, you see more, we're all going to look at things like vinyl blood, right? Mm -hmm. And possibly conveyor belts and okay, there are a few other processing, pieces of processing equipment we'll, we'll look into. But at this point, they like our airborne to mm -hmm. do with incineration mm -hmm. and other sources, um, like fragrances, et cetera, and stuff, and things like that. Um, so there are satellites in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting challenge. We um, we do some testing in our office, and we can test for satellites. Mm -hmm. um, but the levels in food are, are quite low levels, mm -hmm. not like in a final product itself that we can test. And so we had to we had to seek out a lab, and we worked with a lab in Belgium. Um, so we were like the first organization to ever send mm -hmm. like craft cheese mm -hmm. to Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? 